on City TV. My name is Inno Safo. Coming up. Ghana Education Service refers eight Chiana Senior High School students to the disciplinary committee of the school following President Okufuado's intervention and call for the revocation of the decision to dismiss them for making derogatory comments about him. The president felt that it was only right and proper that, I mean, in terms of the overall purpose of the punishment, it does not only really become retributive, but he also considers or we also consider the fact that it will reform the children at the same time, whilst, I mean, the education is not truncated. Seven dead and eight others in critical condition following a fatal crash that occurred at Gomwa Antaze on the Winneba Mankasim Highway on Thursday night. We, we interviewed about three or four people who were still alive and they were uh, 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 conscious. They said the driver was overspeeding and all, every, almost everybody in the car was advising him to reduce speed. And later, Minority in Parliament describes government's one district, one factory policy as a complete failure. Individual bondholders push for a coalition for all groups calling on the government to exempt individual bondholders from its debt exchange program to have a united front to reach a consensus with the government. Let's settle for the details of our stories to our first story. The Ghana Education Service has referred the matter of the eight Chiana Senior High School students to the disciplinary committee of the school. The eight were dismissed by the GES after making derogatory comments about President Ekufuado. The president subsequently intervened and called for the revocation of the decision to dismiss the students and to consider alternative disciplinary action. There's more in this report by City News's Anne Shirley Zhu. President Akufado, following calls from the minority in parliament and other concerned groups, intervened on Friday in the dismissal of eight students of the Chiana Senior High School in the Kasana Nankanan West District of the Upper East Region. The Ministry of Education, in view of this, called on the Ghana Education Service to revoke its decision and consider alternative sanctions. The GES, in response, says the matter has been referred to the China Senior High School's Disciplinary Committee to prefer alternative disciplinary action. The Public Relations Officer of the Ministry of Education, Kwesi Kwarten, spoke to City News. The President has intervened. And uh, the intervention was that rapid uh, because in less than a few hours after uh, GES, management of GES has taken a decision uh, of, course, of confirming or approving what the disciplinary committee did, uh, that is to dismiss the students. The president felt that it was only right and proper that, I mean, in terms of the overall purpose of the punishment, it does not only really become retributive. But he also considers, or we also consider the fact that it will reform the children at the same time, whilst, I mean, the education is not truncated. So, against it backdrop, the president, I mean, felt that the Ministry of Education should also step in and, 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 and review the decision. It was this reason why the Minister for Education, Dr. Osei Duchim, directed uh, that Ghana Education Service or management of Ghana Education Service should review or vary the punishment, i.e., uh, that is, in terms of the dismissal, apparently uh, cancelling that or uh, more or less giving a different alternative form of 
uh, disciplinary action. The GS rules are clear, even though largely the schools have their own internal rules and regulations or code of conduct that guides them. Uh, when it comes to the usage of mobile phones, it's something that, as the policy stands, is, is not allowed until, of course, there is a review of that. It's not allowed in a various schools. So even that act alone of possessing the mobile phone was something that the law was, was, was not in conformity with. Yes, does not have a general policy code when it comes to rules and regulations and conducts and defining the offenses and the penalty prescribed to it accordingly. But at the various schools, within the various institutional level, they have their own code of conduct. So unless, of course, we may have to refer to them, but obviously uh, the disciplinary committee, when it was set up in the schools to try, I mean, look into the matter of the girls, they factored in all what has been provided and the penalty that is uh, prescribed to it accordingly. It's important to also know that, I mean, rules of natural justice were also not negated because they were also invited and were social together with their parents to also answer questions. The executive director of Child Rights International, Right Up Here, also believes the intervention by the president is timely. For the president to say that um, uh, they should look about the alternative systems of providing different action to their children. It's time to reason that uh, their right to education will not be denied. Uh, they will still have access to the school environment and then do what is expected of them. Uh, and that, for me, is, is a good call. Uh, one of the things that we should also look at is the fact that we need to clean up our school system and ensure that the environment is conducive for learning. And if you say learning, it's not only about academic activities, but it's also how morally children can conduct themselves in the school environment. So it is still important that though the president has uh, requested that they review the punishment regime, it is also equally important that the school should also make available the report for us to know the policy learnings that we can pick from so that in the future or moving forward, we can base on some of these findings to put up a program and activities that will be beneficial to our, our, our children. We must also look at the best interests of children, how you want to train the children, what you think is best for the children, and what you can also do to address the basic needs of children, because they are, they are growing and they are developing. So their developmental stages must also be taken into consideration when they are formulating policies, because there are certain characters that children can easily exhibit because they are developing. So it is, it is as a result of the disciplinary things that can regulate how they even develop. So if we just allow children to develop anyhow, and when they begin to show the symptoms, we think that they deserve punishment. Meanwhile, the eight students have been asked to report to the headmistress of the school for further direction. Now seven passengers have died while eight others are in critical condition following a fatal crash that occurred at Gumwan Tadze on the Winneba Mankasim Highway on Thursday night. Our central regional correspondent Calvis Tete has more in the following report. The seven passengers, made up of three females and four males, died on the spot while eight other passengers who sustained injuries have been taken to a health facility in Apam and Mankasim. According to information gathered by City News, a bar under the Sprinter minibus with registration number GW7920-22 got broken and caused the driver to lose grip of the steering wheel due to the speed. The vehicle veered off the road and somersaulted multiple times before hitting a tree. The impact caused nearly half of the people on board to die instantly. Reports indicate that the driver was competing with another driver for passengers along the highway. ACFO2 Adolf Ankumanyama is the Apam District Fire Officer and he spoke to City News about the incident. 20 zero zero hours, which is 8 o'clock, somebody came to the station and informed us. So we rushed to the place and really close to Gomwa and we, we came and found this uh, sprinter bus, Mercedes sprinter bus, lying on its side. And uh, we, we, we tried to uh, rescue those who were trapped. Almost all of them were trapped. But because it was lying on this side, uh, it, it made our work very difficult. So a towing car came and uh, 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 overturned it on its wheels uh, uh, before we were able to rescue all of them. 
uh, at the spot, uh, 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 seven people uh, were dead. We uh, we interviewed about three or four people who were still alive and they were uh, 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 conscious. They said the driver was overspeeding and all, every, almost everybody in the car was advising him to reduce speed. He was jumping ramps. So he met another sprinter bus and, and uh, he wanted to overtake it. But as they were racing, because the other, other vehicle too was also running fast, they didn't want to give it a chance. As they were racing, they heard noise under their car as if something was broken. And then the driver lost control and they veered uh, into the bush. And I, I, it traveled, you, could, you could see it traveled some uh, distance before it hit this big tree and the vehicle stopped. So it is overspeeding. The, 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 the drivers should take caution. They should uh, uh, get restrained when they are behind the wheels. A similar accident occurred two weeks ago at the same spot and resulted in the death of one person. Several other passengers also sustained injuries. There are growing concerns over the increasing number. Now, former executives of Commonwealth and Saba Hall say they will continue to be at the premises of the halls to demand their rights. The executives are part of continuing students who have been affected by the school's new residential policy. This policy restrains all students, apart from freshmen, from being residents of the two halls. This is in line with the school's strategy to curb any form of vandalism as seen in previous academic years. On day two of reopening day, there was police visibility at the entrances of the two halls to prevent the affected students from entering. My colleague Akosia Autry witnessed events for us and joins us with the report. Akosia, what can you tell us? So it's day two of reopening for students here at the University of Ghana. On Thursday, January 12th, we saw a number of students uh, tripping into the schools to uh, get their luggage back into their halls, uh, getting ready for academic activities to officially begin. But also on the side, we saw students of the University of Ghana who uh, previously were based in the Commonwealth and then the Saba Halls uh, coming here on campus to demand for their rights and also to ask the management of the school to um, allow them have access or gain access to the previous Halls. I'm seeing a few police officers around as compared to yesterday, uh, the visibility that we saw uh, on campus manning these two halls. Uh, today, a few police officers also ensuring that they are abiding by the rules or the directives that have been given by the management of the school that is preventing the continuing students from gaining access to the main halls and so that's exactly what is happening but today I have not really seen uh, more of these continuing students just a few of them and specifically the former executives of the halls. I personally wanted to see someone I mean at the tutorial office for something and then I got here today and it's still the same thing people are saying I mean the security personnel are saying that um, they are not allowing us we continuing students in but then fine my problem is school is in session now because if you are leaving people from Kumase people from Tamale I mean they traveling from far places to campus and then they get to campus and then they realize that no they, they don't have any place to sleep I think it's it's actually a bad thing uh, on, on management side but, but, but speaking about management, so they've said that they have assigned you to various halls. Fine. Um, why I'm saying this is, uh, honestly, the, the money we are paying there, it's, it's, I mean, it's too much. For how long are you going to come here to stand in front of the halls? How as, long? As, for me, as long as we can, we can be. As long as, because we, we want the hall back. It is not right. It is not right. If we, we are going to be coming here every day, we will do that. Some of us came to Commonwealth because of our financial um, burdens. 
I know that when I come to Commonwealth, it is about 750 that I'll pay SM. But you taking me out of Commonwealth and taking me to diaspora for me to pay about 4,000 CDs. So your decision to uh, request for your recall back to the halls is not specifically about let's come and form clicks, you know, vandals and have meetings and, you know, do all sort of things. No, no, no. They are of the view that we are violent people. But vandalism is never about uh, violence. You see, the vandal name is even an acronym. The V stands for vivacious, the A stands for affable, the N stands for neighborly, the D stands for dedicated, the A again stands for altruistic, and the L stands for loyal. Those are the attributes that come together to make a vandal. But they want to make the perception that we are violent people, but that's not the case. When I came to Commonwealth Hall, it has embedded in me a lot of qualities that I, I wouldn't want a... Uh, maybe my son or my brother who is now coming into the university not to experience what I experienced over there. Because if you leave only level hundreds over there, they will not be able to, like, the culture wouldn't be in them, you see. It's not... It's what just, culture are you talking about? What culture? Yeah, it's the vandalism culture. Meanwhile, management of the University of Ghana has made their intentions known that it would continue to deploy security to Mandy's halls. As long as um, people decide not to go by the rules or the policies that are being implemented, and as long as they threaten that they want to take matters into their own hands. I mean, the security will be there to ensure that there is peace. If a court has given an injunction and the university says it is fighting that injunction, it, is, it doesn't lie in your place to say you want to enforce the court's injunction, you know, physically. I mean, if you disagree with what the university is doing, you still go back to the court and cite the university for contempt. But it is act of lawlessness for you to say that because the court has said this and we are going to enforce it on behalf of the court. It doesn't, it doesn't make um, them look too good. I mean, it's, I don't think it is the best. And I appeal to the very fine, fine gentlemen um, who are also old vandals. I appeal to them. President Mahama is, 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 is an old vandal. I appeal to him. Um, the Chief Justice is an old vandal. And they are very, Idrisu Haruna, they are very refined and very, very nice gentlemen who are old vandals. I, I know them. Many of them are very decent. I appeal to them that um, we know. I've been a student here all my life and we know what vandalism is about. Um, it's not about lawlessness. And so I appeal to them to also try to intervene, to speak to their people, members, and then to also um, play a leading role in engaging management with a view to bringing some finality to some of these things. I don't think it helps anybody. Reporting from the University of Ghana campus, Akusia Otre, for City News. A labor analyst, Austin Gomez, says the 30% base pay increase for public sector workers may lose its value if Ghana's economic situation is not stabilized. Now, government, after nine meetings with organized labor, agreed to increase the base pay on single spine salaries of public sector workers by 30% payable January 2023. Now, City News' Kweku Ejama Ansa has uh, the rest of the story. Kweku, tell us more. Right. So it took a government at least nine separate meetings between itself and organized labor to be able to reach an agreement or a consensus on the base pay increment for all public sector workers. Remember that organized labor had been calling for 60% upward adjustment in the base pay um, of persons on the single spine salary uh, structure, which they say that it had been necessitated following the economic quagmire. Well, after a marathon of meetings, the government agreed to settle with 30% upward adjustment in the base pay of all public sector workers. But what really accounted for the delay in this particular agreement? You remember the 4 and 7% that was given us. And uh, our members were not very happy. And it is justifiable because of the economic situation, the hardship that 
we, we find ourselves as a country. The incessant increases of prices of goods and services, transport hikes, among others, that also worsen the economic situation, that wipes away the disposable income of our members. And for that matter, our members were not happy. We ourselves were also not happy. And it generated a lot of generated a lot of perceptions. So we decided that looking at the way now inflation is about fifty over fifty four point one percent. So you can imagine that. So we are saying that we have to demand what is expected of us. So the agreed base pay increment is 30%, but it's not sufficient. Well, stakeholders have been interacting with such a news on that. The, the understanding is that we are going to work towards getting the rest of the issues addressed. And we've also committed that we're going to work with government to ensure and uh, that uh, whatever we can do to build our country, to make it great and strong, we'll get it done. So that is where we are, that we've gotten 30%. Yes, if you look at the variables uh, at stake, you're talking about the issue of inflation, you're talking about uh, the issue of rent, talking about the prices of food, rent, and the general goods and services. We are all aware. You don't need a prophet to tell you of what is happening now. But given the economic circumstances and conditions that we find ourselves in, and the 30% is a win-win kind of uh, approach. And we think that that is the way to go. And with the intent of working to bridge the outstanding uh, deficits. For now, we will say that We've gotten to a point, but it will also give us the opportunity to strategize, even for next year, because we are studying the economic trends, okay? We are studying the economic trends. I wouldn't be surprised if, if this inflation is not curtailed, it will erode the gains that we have, and that will give us the opportunity to strategically position ourselves. Okay, and also demand for better percentage for our members that we are leading in this regard. Meanwhile, a labor analyst, Austin Game, believes that the government must do more for public sector workers. He says that the 30% increment may be eroded if the current economic situation is not stabilized. If you project that we have uh, currently uh, end of year 54 point something percent being inflation and not knowing what the consequences will be on all of us from an economic point of view, 30% uh, is a compromised figure. It may not be, if, if things go haywire, it becomes useless. Nonetheless, it will serve a purpose. So for stakeholders, they say that the only way government can make sure that workers are happy in the country is to be able to stabilize the current economic situation. They say that anything apart from that would mean that um, all the gains that have been made would be eroded. Reporting for City News, my name is Kweku Ediamansa. In other stories this hour, Individual Bondholders Association of Ghana is pushing for the formation of a coalition for all groups, calling on the government to exempt individual bondholders from the, its debt exchange program. The convener, Martin Pebu, a private legal practitioner, is also leading about 200 individual investors who do not want any haircuts on their matured investments. Speaking to City News, Mr. Pigbu says the decision is to have a united front to reach a consensus with the government. The following report has more. Individual Bondholders Association of Ghana and the Pensioners Bondholders Forum are the three groups appealing to the government to exempt them from its debt exchange program. Government is embarking on the debt exchange program as a measure to manage its high debt levels. 
In the program, domestic bondholders are expected to exchange their bonds for longer dated bonds. This move has been met with stiff opposition by various stakeholders. They lament the move will have dire consequences on their livelihood. But for convener for the Individual Bondholders Association of Ghana, Martin Pibu, forming a united force to press on their demands is the surest way for government to heed to their demands. You know, we usually say in life, in unity lies strength, right? Mm -hmm. And also in two heads are better than one. So based on this axioms and the rest that we use in running our lives, it just became the rational thing to do, to join forces. Yes, so that's why we are joining forces. And we are practically merged. You remember, uh, I granted an earlier interview where I said talks were far advanced and we're going to a, a meeting, our first meeting together, and we did. So this afternoon, we went to Parliament House to present a copy of our petition. Yes, yeah, so the majority leader uh, felt our sentiments, and he also has constituents who also have bonds. So he knows it's something that touches everybody in Ghana, every MP especially. Yes, and I also say everybody because, you know, in the domestic debt exchange uh, document, hmm, it's written on page 13, government is threatened that it may come to treasury bills. And you know, treasury bills are the commonest form of uh, investment that government investment that people do. So there's a threat to all of us as Ghanaians. The deadline for the invitation of bondholders is Monday, January 16, 2023. In this regard, Mr. Pebu urged bondholders not to panic since the government can't forcibly include their bonds if they reject it. He further called on President Akufado to instruct the finance minister to rescind its decision to include individual bondholders. We are calling up upon President Ekufuado to do the needful. He should, as soon as possible, kindly instruct the finance minister to announce the reversal of the policy. Because among others, apart from all the things that I've said, this policy that they brought has eroded the confidence of the people in the presidency. Yes, yes, and in his government, he shouldn't do that. We don't deserve this. So his government that is begging us, bring and then let me uh, give you new ones i'll pay later so if they say bring and you say no i won't bring you don't lose your money we don't lose so monday is not a do or die affair at all it's not a do or die affair there's no risk that you've not signed up monday comes and it passes but rather monday will be critical for government because then by that the government will check with the banks and everybody to see are there enough people who have signed up? If it doesn't, so it's rather critical for government, but for bondholders, it's nothing. For the Pensioners Bondholders Forum, the call for coalition is a good move. Andrew Entry, the convener for the group, however, pleaded for the government to give them a listening ear since pensioners with government bonds are the biggest persons who will bear the brunt. I'm still appealing to the Minister of Finance that they should look at our petition. Every house there is an aged person. These people must be protected. In our adage, we have an adage, spend on, but you, you, you stop. You didn't do that. Somebody could have used it to do whatever you want to do, but say no. Life has some stage where you may not be able to do anything. So let me not use my money like that save it even though he needed something that he could have bought with that money to enjoy life and say well, let me keep it when i grow i may not be able to take care of myself so i'll suspend my consumption and put it there now that he's going to use it to take care of himself or herself you want to impair it and let him become a bedding on others or go to the roadside and be begging that should not be what this country should be looking at. 
Now, the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Northern Development Authority, Patrick Seydu, has been sacked by President Nana Ekufuado. A letter signed by the Chief of Staff, Frima Osei Opari, noted that Mr. Seydu is expected to comprehensively hand over his duties and any official property to the Chief Executive Officer of the Northern Development Authority before his departure. His dismissal is expected to take effect from March 21, 2023. You're still watching the City Newsroom on City TV. Still ahead. Minority in Parliament describes government's one district, one factory policy as a complete failure. We'll bring you the details shortly. Do stay. Graded the one Ghana city coin with enhanced security features. The coin will be put into circulation from 12 December 2022. It is similar to the existing one Ghana city coin in shape, form, and images. The coat of arms in front and the scale of justice at the back. The upgraded one Ghana city coin is bimetallic with outer gold and inner silver. The coin has a pronounced rough edge and incorporates a latent image which appears in a rectangular form below the scale of justice at the back. The latent image changes from a radiating star to a one Ghana city symbol sandwiched between two stars when tilted. The assistant and the upgraded one Ghana city coins will co-circulate until the assistant coin is gradually withdrawn. The general public is encouraged to accept the coins and use them. This is the neighborhood I'm having my toys. The very reason why I took it for us. See, the price is very good and it's spacious to contain all of us. Alpha Med City. Now I'm a landlord. I don't pay rent. And my Airbnb business is booming. Bank in Amina Rasi Anate Alphabet City. The pension pay mu 20%. The payment plan, I want to share my money. Just say, and you're very smooth. This is a healthy place to raise our families and create in peace. Come on, be my neighbor. Alphabet City, the ABC of Home Sweet Home. Alphabet City is a classy and peaceful gated community in Sakumono. We have 24 7 top notch security and high quality access roads. We have three bedrooms and two washrooms. Three bedrooms and three washrooms with boys' quarters. We have three bedrooms and four washrooms. We have two bedrooms and two washrooms, all with beautiful kitchens and kitchenettes. Call Alphabet City on 0240 or 050 Alphabet City, the ABC of Home Sweet Home. You're welcome back. Now, the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Mr. Samuel Abdullahi Jinapur, has been appointed to replace Ken Oforiata as the caretaker of the Ministry of Trade and Industry. A statement signed by the Director of Communications at the Office of the President, Eugene Ahin, said the Lands Minister is expected to replace Alan Chermating on Monday, January 16. Alan Chermatin resigned from the position last week to prepare himself for the new Patriotic Party's flag bearership race. The Minister for Greek, Ousu Friyakuto, also resigned on January 10 over similar reasons.
Now, some stakeholders within the agricultural sectors have expressed mixed reactions at a decision by President Akufuado to appoint the Fisheries and Aquaculture Minister Mavis Hawa Kumsen to act as caretaker of the Food and Agriculture Ministry. Now, according to one of the stakeholders, Great Accra Poultry Farmers Association, Madam Kumsen must be up and doing to address the many challenges in the sector. There's more in this report filed by City News' Philip Ni Latte. Philip, what more have they been saying? On Thursday, January 12, 2023, President Ekofado asked the Minister for Fisheries and Agriculture Development, Mavis Hawakum Singh, to be the caretaker minister for the Food and Agriculture Ministry. This follows uh, the resignation of uh, the minister for that particular sector, that is Dr. Efriye Ousu Akoto. Um, the sector is deemed as one of the biggest when it comes to all the ministries in the country. On the City Newsroom, I will speak to the stakeholders in the sector and find out from them how they welcome the decision by the president to make Hawa Kumsen as the caretaker for the sector. Yes, we, we, we welcome her and want to cooperate with her, want to do our best to ensure that she's, I mean, she succeeds. However, there's a lot of work to be done to ensure that the poultry industry is sustained. I mean, he's the main chief appointing authority, and he thinks that this is the player that he needs to ensure that he delivers upon his promise. So our, I mean, uh, duty is to ensure that he delivers to ensure that at least the portrait industry is sustained. That is Howard. That's how our concern. Because uh, uh, the support that we need in the portrait industry is enormous. One, we need maize. As I'm talking to you now, uh, we are finding it difficult to have enough maize for production. And yes, this is just the beginning of the year. Less than three weeks, I mean, within January, we are finding it difficult. And also, the prices I mean, have started going up. Immediate prices of maize begin to go up. Automatically, prices of it will go up. And this is an area we wanted to have a second look at because we know the maize is in the system, but information reaching us is that uh, our neighboring countries have started, I mean, buying them and taking them away. And when it happens that way, it affects the local production. And the essence of this, uh, uh, we producing to support the local, we are unable to benefit as a country. So that's one area. Again, another area is to help this uh, soya bean meal, the local I mean, producers. The General Secretary of the General Agricultural Workers Union, Edward Kaiwa, says it would have been a step in the right direction if a deputy minister at the Agri Ministry was made to be at the helm of affairs as the president prepares to appoint a substantive minister. Uh, that should have been the case in the sense that a deputy minister is close to a minister, you know, and uh, it's only for legal reasons, constitutional reasons, that even if you're a deputy minister, you still have to be vetted to have a substantive uh, ministry. So if indeed we are determined to actually fill that place as soon as possible, I think that His Excellency should have kicked in the processes of uh, nominating one of the deputies or any other person to be vetted by parliament and then take over uh, the ministry. But immediately you hear that there's a, a caretaker minister, you ask yourself, what is so urgent in the ministry that we need a caretaker minister to prosecute that particular uh, project? And we should be ready to ask uh, our leaders to also account to us. When you say a caretaker minister, within the period that the person will be a caretaker, should be able to account to us what, will be, what are the, her achievements, you know, for the period that she has been caretaker. Otherwise, we think that we could have just kicked in the processes of getting a, a substantive minister. For the stakeholders, the caretaker minister, that is Mavis Hawakumsen, has a lot of work to do within the sector. Reporting for City News, my name is Philip Nihilate.
Now, the minority in parliament says the government's one district, one factory policy has been a complete failure despite the expenditure of over 10 billion cities on the project. The group says the intervention has failed to tackle the unemployment situation, bridge the gap between agriculture and industry, and cut down on imports and increase foreign exchange earnings. City News' Ni Ayikwe Okain has more in the following report. The government's One District, One Factory initiative seeks to change the nature of Ghana's economy from one which is dependent on imports and exports of raw material to manufacturing, value addition and exports of processed goods. In the 2023 budget, the government announced that 296 of the projects were at various stages of implementation, out of which 126 were operational, 143 were under construction, and 27 considered as pipeline projects. Addressing the media, the ranking member on the Trade and Industry Committee of Parliament, Emmanuel Amakofibua, described the intervention as a complete failure despite the expenditure of about 10 billion cities on the projects. After seven years of huge investments, over 10 billion investment in 1D1F, in exemptions, in stimulus packages, in what they call uh, banking sector support, this is what the Minister of Finance said in the 2023 budget. And it's so telling, and I quote, Mr. Speaker, Ghana's heavy dependence on import places tremendous pressure on the city, thus creating an unfavorable balance of payment position. On average, Ghana's import bill exceeds $10 billion annually and is accounted for by the diverse range of items under the Ghana Cares program Government aims to pro, pro, now, this is now, government is now thinking about a new thing after seven years. Government aims to provide support to private sector in targeted sectors in order to accelerate competitive import substitution and export expansion, which will contribute to the overacting objective of revitalizing and transforming the economy by the end of 2023. The government will therefore promote the formation of partnerships with existing and prospective businesses to expand, rehabilitate, and establish manufacturing plants targeted at these selected items, including iron, steel, aluminium, sugar, rice, fish, poultry, palm, palm oil, and cement. This is after the fact. This is Ken Oferiata in the 2023 budget, unquote. This succession by the government in the 2023 budget is a clear admission of the failure of the 1D1F industrialization agenda. The 1D1F project has been a complete failure and a waste of resources. We call on the banks providing funding to support this one initiative to confirm the disbursement of these allocations. Finally, the MPP government must account for, to the taxpayers for this failed policy initiative. The minority wants the government to account for all the resources that have been channeled into what they describe as the failed projects under the 1D1F initiative. Reporting from Parliament, my name is Ni Ayukwe Okain for City News. The National Petroleum Authority has cautioned the public against dealing with some 30 oil marketing companies across the country over their failure to abide by license regulations. According to the NPA, anyone who deals with the said OMCs on its list does so at their own risk. Fred Duho has the full list of the companies. The National Petroleum Authority, NPA, has revoked the licenses of about 30 oil marketing companies across the country and these companies we understand do not comply with the directive or the rules and regulations concerning their licenses hence from october 2022 the npa took the decision to revoke their licenses and henceforth has proceeded to caution the public to disease from engaging any of these oil marketing companies across the country. First on the list is the Abagurugu Oil Company Limited, Apex Petroleum Ghana Limited, Avos Oil Company Limited, Best Petroleum Limited, Bisbell Petroleum Services, 
Capstone Oil Limited, Deep Petroleum Limited, Deliman and Company Limited, Glee Oil Company Limited, Golden Petroleum Limited, Green Petroleum Limited, Hack Oil Company Limited, Avila Oil Ghana Limited, the list continues. Hosanna Oil Company Limited, Jazz Petroleum Limited, Lily Gold Energy Resources Limited, M3 Global Company Limited, Myga and HHM Company Limited, MBA Global Petroleum Limited, Petra Energy Limited, Petro Afrique Ghana Limited, Precious Energy Ghana Limited, Q8 Oil Ghana Limited, Ring World Petroleum Services Limited, Royal Roses Oil Company Limited, Titan Petroleum Limited, Union Oil Ghana Limited, Universal Oil Company Limited, Warren Oil Company Limited, and Zoe Petroleum Limited. So that makes a list of 30 OMCs that have since had their licenses revoked by the supervisory authority, which is the NPA. And they are thereby cautioning the public not to do any business with these listed companies. Any decision to engage the services of these companies would be at your own risk. And hence, this caution is going out, especially to motorists. My name is Fred Duho, reporting from Jolu, the NPA office for City News. You're still watching the City Newsroom on City TV, still to come. Residents of Boko in the Upper East region call for intensive patrols on the Boko Bolga Pulimakum to protect residents from armed robbers. We'll bring you the details shortly. Do stay with us. for the first time in years was uh, a little bit awkward. Grandpa still tried to entertain us. Mom was always doing the spotlight from the kids. It wasn't until Grandma cracked a joke. That's my favorite prayer. That we got back into our groove. And this festive, DSTV is making family time even better with an upgrade. Stay connected to DSTV and we'll upgrade you to the next package for free. A great journey lies ahead of us all and we all have different paths carved out for us. No matter who you are and the path you're on, make sure you choose a partner you can trust. A partner with integrity who will always give you the support you need when you need it. No matter what you do and where you are in your journey in life, you are very significant, and so is the path you're on. Consolidated Bank Ghana, CBG, cherishes financial security as much as you do and shares the same values as you. That is why we are the right financial partner to stand with you. We are now one of the largest banks in Ghana, and we are ready to partner and work with you. CBG, we stand with you. Fine. Anyone can become a household. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you go flip a real estate gaming platform that allows you to play and stand a chance of winning a house or cash or consolidated yeah. plans, such as savings towards a house. Simple and easy to play. Visit www.yougoflip.com. Buy a ticket to enter the game. Wait for the end of the game to enjoy the win. Anyone can win. Flip it or own it. You go. You go flip. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Play responsible, not for persons below 18 years, and gaming can be addictive.
You're welcome back. Let's go to the Upper East Region where Youth Association in Boko is calling for intensive patrols of all troubled routes and escorts for travelers plying the Boko Boga Pulimakam highways to avert attacks on travelers. According to the group, attacks on travelers along the Boko Bolga and Boko to Pulimakom highways have resulted in the death of seven persons. The group wants government and the security agencies to provide escort services at all times for the traveling public plying the two highways to prevent the needless deaths. The protracted Boku Egne conflict has turned the glorious economic hub of Boku into a ghost town. The situation has not only led to loss of lives and property, but have compelled businesses to fold up and public sector workers seeking massive transfers out of Boku. The imposition of a ban on motorbike riding wearing of smokes and a curfew from 8 o'clock p.m. to 5 o'clock a.m. daily forms government's initiatives to forestall peace in Boko. But feuding factions allege that the spillover of the conflict in some specific routes is life-threatening to their livelihoods. Addressing a press conference in Boko, the Youth Association appealed for extension of patrols and escorts to the Boku Pulmakom and Boku Bolga roads. Spokesperson for the group Abdul Majid Bagura said government and security agencies must intensify patrols and regular escorts along the two highways to save lives. Add that particular attention is paid to all the travel routes. The Boku Bolga Pulmakom Highway, being the most precarious route to fly, has long been ignored by the government and the regional minister. Over 90% of the ambushes, roadblocks, attacks, and loss of lives and properties have occurred along that stretch because of government's failure to provide security. In this regard, we appeal to the security agencies and the Upper East Regional Minister to provide regular escort and patrols to the targeted highways, especially along the Boku Bolga Pulmakom Highway, to save lives and property. Some traders and drivers plying their trade along the Boku Pulmakom route have been sharing their ordeal with City News and plead for regular escorts. Right now, our main problem is that all of us are patrolling uh, Boku Sankasi Way. But right now, more than one year, nobody can go to that market. Lack of security. And with Anna Road, nobody can go there. Lack of security. Right now, if you pass to Sabong or you see that, you will see that place is very quiet. If any car is passing there, they will stop and check. Any motor is passing there, they will stop and check. There are two months be that. No way. To block our road. That was no pass. I mean, I myself, two times, they fire me in the San Council with escorts. Just near here, Sabong here, they block the road. There no nobody to pass. There is some yore yore here if you take people and leave there. And they drop the people, give them either you know, and collect all your money. Boko Municipal Chief Executive Hamza Amadou tells City News his outfit is yet to officially receive the demands for regular escorts and patrols on trouble routes. Mr. Amadou said, although the demands could be an expensive venture, a review of the current escorts and patrols measures may be necessary. We know that in 2021, we have been doing escort for almost all the tribes in Boko since this conflict erupted. As of yesterday, I did escort. I escorted people from Bolga to Boko. And so the military and the police have been doing that. It has been their mandate to do that. And they've been doing that. I'm yet to chance an opportunity that a request has been made for some people to be escorted and we have not honored that request. I'm yet to get to know that, but indeed. But I want to look at it from this. Possibly the, the, the escort is not effective or patrols is not effective. 
So if the patrols are not effective, then there's a need for us to go back to the drawing board. If a request comes before us, then we look at it holistically. But generally, like I'm saying, you should know that it will come with a lot of cost to central government. We are already at the assembly level inundated by the cost of this conflict. I cannot estimate the number, the amount of money that the assembly has completely expended as far as taking care of this conflict situation is concerned. The feuding factions in the Boko ethnic conflict, that's the Tusasis and the Mampuses, have expressed dissatisfaction about attacks on their persons on the Bolga Tamale Highway and the Boko Pulmakom Highway. The youth groups of these feuding factions, that's the Kusa Youth Group and the Mampurugu Youth Group Associations, are therefore calling on government and the security agencies to provide 24 7 escorts for travelers on these two highways to avert further attacks. Reporting for certain news, I'm Frederick Awuni, Boko. Just before we go, former President John Ajakum Kufo is advocating for stronger trade partnership between Africa and Europe. He believes the two continents will be able to establish a formidable market against the other continents so far as international trade is concerned. The following report by Caldas Tete has more. Former President John Ejekum Kufo believes that competitiveness is the surest way to avoid being left on the sidelines of the global market. He suggests that a collaborative effort between Africa and Europe could lead to the establishment of a formidable market force against other continents. He believes Africa's possession of vast natural resources, human resources, and its explosive population growth when linked to Europe's know-how and financial capital can make this dream a reality. According to him, this should not be difficult to achieve considering that the two continents are located in the center of the world and only separated by the Mediterranean Sea. Former President Kufo says the establishment of the after secretariat in Ghana is a step in the right direction since it will make the country the pivot of Africa's trade successes. He spoke to City News during a visit to his residence by some 17 CEOs of European companies. And in this global village, which uh, makes the whole world into one market, say unless you are competitive you are left on the sidelines and uh, so africa with all its uh, natural endowments huge continent full of natural resources and with uh, exploding population you know it's estimated within the next decade or two africa mighty two billion people now the youth they are so well educated they are mobile it's a market that should attract any entrepreneur. Uh, as we stand now, we see Europe has got the know-how, has got the technology, the capital, and Europe needs markets. Uh, but when you look geographically at the global map, you see that the Americas are arranged on one side to the west, Asia to the other side, uh, and it's Europe and Africa sitting in the middle. We are divided only by the Mediterranean, which is just a, a very short distance. If the peoples in the middle, like Europe and Africa, would cooperate, uh, share uh, technology uh, on partnership basis fairly, and uh, capital, know-how, then they become the real third force. Uh, against the, uh, Asia, the East, that's Asia, China, India, one side, the America too. And I tell you, uh, we would be very competitive because without competitiveness uh, in the global markets, you, you, you are marginalized. And Africa needs to really get competitive and uh, through the partnerships that we can uh, leapfrog into the arena. Well, that's it for today's edition of the City Newsroom on City TV. Our website, citynewsroom.com, has more information on our top stories and more. Subscribe to CityTube on YouTube for more exclusive video content from City TV.
You can also watch City TV on DSTV Channel 363 and on Go TV Channel 182. My name is Inusapo. Many thanks for watching.